Hi, this is Natalie. Thank you for listening to Crossroads Church, where we are bringing a real God to real people. I believe you'll be inspired by today's message. All right. Well, hey, I'm Joel. I'm the teaching guy around here. Welcome if this is your first time or second time or fifth time. Uh, we're starting a new series today. It's a great day for you to be here. We're starting a series called Savage Jesus. Some of you are probably going, what in the world does that even mean? Savage means wild, untamed, uncontrollable. You know, some of y'all like your kids, right? I'm just kidding. You know, if you, if you look at Jesus, he was a very complex individual. When you look at Jesus, people say a lot of times, what would Jesus do? Well, sometimes even his own disciples didn't know what Jesus would do. There was one time where they're like, Jesus, are you going to call fire down from heaven now on these people? And he's like, no, 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 get that wrong. And then the other times he's like, hey, if they don't accept your word, kick the dust off your feet and leave. It's going to be worse for them in the day of Sodom and Gomorrah than it is, than, than, than it was for Sodom and Gomorrah. And you're like, what? And then other times people were caught, like there's this lady caught in adultery, like she was caught right in the middle of the act and it was clear she was guilty. And Jesus is like, hey, don't, go, go your way. I, I forgive your sins. And everybody's like, uh, Jesus, that girl was very guilty. And you look at Jesus and you go, man, he was a complex individual. And I think we all in our society, we love Hallmark Jesus. <laughs> Come to me all who are weary and heavy laden and I'll give you rest. Like, oh, that's so sweet, Jesus. But then you read other verses, like what we're going to see today, some of the stuff Jesus said, and you're like, dude, that's savage, man. Like, what was that? But we've got, if we want to see, Jesus was God in the flesh. He was the example of what it's like to live according to God's order on earth. So if we're going to look at Jesus, honestly, we've got to look at the stuff that makes us uncomfortable. So maybe the subtitle of this message is get, finding comfort in Jesus's harshest moments. Because Jesus sometimes was harsh. Sometimes you're like, Jesus, that was not very Jesus-like of you. Because sometimes his compassion look, didn't look like what we think is compassionate. So we want to look at some of the things that Jesus did and said that go make you very uncomfortable. And today I want to talk about how to know when it's time to make a scene. So I was in England this week. I went to London. And all over the place there are these signs that say this. See it, say it, sorted. And I'm like, what does that mean? Well, if you don't know what it means, every five minutes on the tube, the under, London Underground, the, the subway system, when I was in this arena I was at, they were every, every five minutes they said, if you see something, say something, and we'll get it sorted for you. I was like, what they were saying is, if you see something out of the ordinary, you need to say something, because there's, there's a threat of terrorism right now. I thought, why do, you know, why do they have to even say that? I realized, that, well, first of all, a lot, the British are very polite people. Very polite. Everyone was so polite over there. I didn't come across a rude person. And they were so polite. And I thought, you know, there's a lot of us that really we go, man, I, you see something, you go, that's a little bit off. You're like, should I say something? But you don't want to make a scene, right? You're like, well, if I say something and like they're where they're supposed to be, you know, like, what's that guy doing there? Well, well, that guy's supposed to be there. You'll feel like a fool. You'll feel embarrassed for having said something or you'll make it awkward for them. And uh, I, it reminded me of, um, of a situation I had when I was in, in high school. I learned in high school, I grew up in Central America, and I learned in high school, if you act like you belong somewhere, nobody will ever question you. That's right. So I had this situation where da my dad, we had a team come to Guatemala, and they wanted, somebody lost their bags. And we actually found out that the situation was that somebody had tagged their bag wrong. G-U-A is the code for Guatemala, and somebody had put G-U-M, which is Guam the other side of the world. Anyway, so we were trying to find this bag, and I kept going to people, and nobody would answer my questions, and I'm like, somebody help me. I'm trying to find this bag. So I started going, you know what? I'm just going to wander around this airport and find this bag. So I just, any door that was open, I, or if I could get open, I'd just go through it, or if somebody opened a door, I'd just come in behind them, and I had a white piece of paper in my hand, and I just charged ahead like I belonged there, and nobody questioned me. I made it all the way down to the tarmac of the airport <laughs> and got into the bin of a plane that had just landed. <laughs> Nobody questioned me. 16 years old, 16, 17 years old. Because you know what? Most of the, most of the time, people just go, well, I don't, that doesn't seem right, but I don't know if I should make a scene. You know? And what it comes down to is it comes down to something in psychology. There's these five big personality traits we talk about with people. 
and uh, there's introversion and extroversion. But one of the big personality traits is something called agreeableness. And agreeableness is your, your kind of your willingness to go along, to get along. Agreeable people are cooperative. They per to, prefer to avoid conflict. They're empathetic. And like I said, they go along to get along. So they're like, well, I don't really want to create a scene. And you can know if you're very agreeable as this. If somebody brings you the wrong thing at the restaurant, do you speak up and say anything? No. My wife never would. She'd be like, oh, I'll just eat it. You're like, that's not even what you ordered. It's fine. I don't want to cause a scene. <laughs> just for the record, I took a profile recently. I am 99% disagreeable. <laughs> Emily agrees. Yeah. So basically, like, I don't, I will speak up. Oftentimes, I speak up probably when somebody shouldn't speak up. And sometimes I create scenes when scenes are unnecessary. Okay? So we're going to talk this morning about how to know when it's time to make a scene. And I'm going to venture to say, you know, most of the world is actually in this category. They're very highly agreeable. Okay? Thank God for that, or we would have a, just a chaotic, savage society. Because we need to cooperate. But some of us, by nature, this is my jam. I'm disagreeable. So what we're going to talk about today, I'm really, this isn't a problem for me, but I know that for most people, it's a problem. Like, should I say something? Because there's something in your life right now where you're thinking that. You're watching your son and the decisions he's making, and you're going, should I say something? Last time I did, though, it didn't go very well. You're watching some decisions your husband is making with finances, and you're kind of like, Oh, I want to trust him and submit to him and be the godly wife, but should I say something? Some of you, man, you've got situations at work, and you're watching your boss do some stuff that's really shady. And you're going, should I say something? But I don't want to cause a scene. and Maybe there's something I don't know. And, and you just assume that everything's okay. But listen, there are times in life when we need to make a scene, when we need to say something. And so we're going to talk about today how to know when it's time to say something. And we're going to look at an incident in Jesus' life, which is pretty fascinating. Because Jesus went hog wild. That's how we say it in Texas. He went hog wild at one moment. <laughs> there's a story. It's right after. Now, this, there's, there's two instances of what is called Jesus cleansing the temple. Okay? It's, mentioned, it's actually mentioned three times, but it's concluded that it happened twice. There's one that he did right at the start of his ministry. It was right after he changed water into wine. This is the one we're going to look at today in John. He did his miracle, and basically his mom's like, it's time, son. Time to step up. Do your miracle. It's time for you to step into your calling. And he's like, okay, we're going to do this. And then, then he picks up the story. But there's another time at the end of his ministry where he cleaned the temple as well. He cleans it out. He just goes in and starts just throw, throwing over tables. I, I got on AI. I was trying to get a picture of Jesus flipping over tables, and I put in Jesus flipping over tables, and it actually put a picture of Jesus doing a backflip over a table. So <laughs> didn't work. Uh, so I have no image for it, but it's like Jesus like, Phew. I was like, well, that's not quite what I was looking for. But anyway, I was like, angry Jesus, turning over tables. So Jesus comes in, he says, here's what happened, okay? So when it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now, I don't know how I missed this, but you know, Jesus did not spend a lot of his time in the city. Most of his time was spent in the countryside. I didn't realize this until I went to Israel. Most of Jesus' time was spent out in the country. It was only during the festivals that he went to Jerusalem. He only went a handful of times in his life. So Jesus shows up to Jerusalem, and in the temple courts, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and others sitting at tables exchanging money. Now, real quick explanation. Uh, the Jewish people, every year at Passover, they would come and sacrifice an animal in remembrance of what happened with Moses. And a lot of people traveled a long distance, so they needed, uh, they needed animals. They couldn't bring the poor people were allowed to sacrifice doves. If you had a little more wealth, you had to sacrifice a sheep. Um, and it had to be these perfect sheep. And what's interesting about this, there's a lot of conjecture about why Jesus flipped out over this. Now, uh, some people say, some people's angle is that this was happening in the outer court. Say, so there were three three basically three places in the temple, the outer court, the inner court, and the holy of holies, right? And the Gentiles, which were people that were non-Jewish, they were only allowed into the outer court. So a lot of people say Jesus got ticked off here because they were blocking the Gentiles' ability to get into the court, and they were selling stuff there instead. They turned it into a marketplace. 
Some people say it was Jesus. At one point, he says, you guys have turned this place into a den of thieves. Clearly, there was some shadiness going on, some of the money changes. Maybe they're giving some bad rate, rates. People were coming from all over the world, Jews were, to do these sacrifices in Jerusalem. So at one point, Jesus gets mad about that. And so maybe that's why he got so mad. Uh, communists, you know, t- t- people tend to have this way of adopting Jesus to be what they want him to be. Rather than seeing Jesus for what he was, they're like, oh, Jesus was like me, right? And so communists say it was because he was practicing capitalism in the church, which is the problem in the world, right? Capitalism is the problem. There's all sorts of various reasons that Jesus did this, but the bottom line is Jesus did not like something that was going down, and he's like, I need to speak up. So here's what he does. He made a whip out of cords and drove all from the temple courts. This is really important to understand, too. This wasn't like a flip-out moment where Jesus, you never, you ever had like a two-year-old that just goes from happy to like, Rah! it wasn't Jesus in two-year-old mode. This was calculated. He took the time to make a whip. (laughs) Do you remember those moments when mom's taking time to make the whip? You're like, it ain't going to be pretty, right? (laughs) Jesus is like, he's forming this whip, and he's like, all right, boys. Very calculated what he was doing. He had taken the time. He's like, this needs to be addressed. So he takes it and he drove out from the temple court, both sheep and cattle. He scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. I mean, Jesus is going nuts with this whip in his hand. To those who sold doves, he said, get these out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a market. His disciples remembered that his written zeal for your house will consume me. Now, the more I study Jesus, I've been hanging out in the church for 45 years. I've been following him for over 40. The more I realize that Jesus's life and the things he said have endless, endless layers of truth to them, okay? Like endless layers. You will never understand everything, the true depth of what Jesus said. As you grow in him, you realize, man, there's so much more to what he said. He was the incarnation, the fleshing out what God on earth would look like. And yet he was fully human. So when you look at his story, you're like, wow, there's a lot to get from him. But but I think the thing that's one of the most outstanding pictures from this story, again, there's so many things you could get from it, is this. There are some things it's worth causing a scene about. If you're called to live a life of truth, there are going to be some times where you say, nope, I can't do this anymore. I have to say something. G.K. Chesterton, he's my favorite author. He says this. He says, tolerance is the virtue of the man without convictions. Think about that for a second. If you have no North Star that you're moving towards... Like, you're like, this is how we're going to get to this point, and this is what it's going to take to get there, and this is how we have to act and behave to get there. Anything will go. Anything will go. King Solomon said it this way, where there is no vision, the people dwell without restraint. So the greatest virtue then becomes tolerance. Well, if your way is as good as my way, but the Bible says there's a way that actually ends to destruction. Every man's way seems right in his own eyes, but there's actually a way that leads to destruction. And if you see somebody going to destruction, and you don't say something about it, you become guilty. Paul says that. He says, rescue those that are heading towards destruction. And tolerance, we live in a world that's like, tolerance is just the best thing. But is it really the best thing if somebody is on the way to destruction with a decision they're making and you're like, well, you go live your truth, man. And this is where Christians get accused of being harsh and, well, why you got to tell me your truth? Well, We really do believe that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And we're doing this out of love. Now, And this is where the problem becomes. Because a lot of times we aren't doing it out of love. We're doing it out of anger. And when it's time to address things and it's time to speak up, it's really important that you do it boldly and courageously, but you have to use minimum necessary force. Because what we've been guilty of as Christians a lot of times is going in and dropping the truth bomb and then walking away. And you know, you may have conquered them, you may have won the battle, but you lost the war, man, because vanquishing the enemy, the people who have been vanquished or conquered, they don't usually like to hang out with the people that conquered them. And the goal is to the relationship, is the restoration of relationship. That's why Jesus went so crazy in the temple, I believe, because they were making it difficult to get to God. And Jesus is like, no, my job here is to make it, to restore the relationship with God. And what you've created here is a mess that's making more complications to get to God. So he speaks up, and he speaks up very violently. And listen, there's nothing wrong with using your strength in the right proportion to stand up for what's right. In fact, a guy I like to follow, his name is Jordan Peterson, says this. He says, a harmless man is not a good man. A good man is a very dangerous man who has that under voluntary control. 
And I want to talk specifically to men for a second because we live in this world right now where men have kind of been put on the back shelf as everything that's that about a man is bad. It's toxic. Listen to me. What God put in you, that desire to protect, that desire to defend, that desire to be strong, don't e- let ever, ever let anybody tell you that is wrong. That thing he put in you is from God, and it's for a purpose. Because you know what happens when men are weak? Women and children suffer. They're the first ones to suffer. God calls men to stand up and be men. Because uh, you, you've probably heard it said, they say strong men create good times, and then good times create weak men, and then weak men create bad times, and then the cycle has to start over again. And men, there's something within all of us that wants to be heroic and wants to stand up and defend. Don't let anybody tell you that's wrong. Don't let anybody tell you, well, that's oppressive. No, it's not oppressive if you're doing it for good, because this is one thing that Jesus said. He said, listen, the meek will inherit the earth, and meekness is not weakness. Meekness is strength under control. It's, it's not being a harmless man. You have to have some serious capacity to do real damage and then decide to keep it under control and use that for good. That's what makes someone a good person. Right. If you don't have that, Frederick Nietzsche, he's a guy we don't quote much in church. Um, <laughs> he said it this way. He's like, he's like, I've often laughed at men who thought themselves virtuous because they had no claws. I'm like, that's pretty accurate. Like, you're not virtuous. You're just a pansy. And we're living in a world where it's like, well, if tolerance is the ultimate virtue, then being a pansy is the ultimate virtue. But it's not. Strength, strength that is under control, that is used for righteousness, is the right thing. And we live in a world right now that's telling men, oh, man, everything about you is toxic. It's toxic if you're using it for your own good. But if you're using it to defend the weak and to help the poor and to stand up for women and children, you're in the right place, men. And that's what you're called to do. There's nothing wrong with being strong, men, if you're using that strength for the right purposes. And we need you to be strong. So here's my key point here. If there's nothing of value in your life that causes you to get passionate enough to speak up, it's quite possible you aren't taking enough responsibility for what God has given to you. And when I say value, this is really important. The latest stats on your favorite quarterback is not of value. I know some men that know more about their quarterback stats than they do about what's going on in their teenage daughter's life. And that's tragic. That's not taking responsibility for what you've been given. Men, specifically, I'm going to keep harping on men because I believe in y'all, and I am one. Uh, we, We need to recognize that the things that are of greatest value in our life are, first of all, God, second of all, our spouse, and third of all, our kids. If you're not willing to fight for any of those and give up some things and sacrifice for those things, then your values are out of order. And you need to step up and take some responsibility in that area. But here's the beautiful thing about taking responsibility. It brings a lot of meaning to your life. That's good. It brings the, 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 I was listening to a guy this week, and he said a lot of the anxiety we're having in the world is because people haven't taken enough responsibility. And when you don't have anything to be responsible for, you just have a lot of time to be anxious. Yep. That's really good. So we step up. And there's some things that need to be spoken about and some things that need to be addressed. And you might need to do it in a fairly aggressive manner, but you have to do it wisely. You have to use minimum necessary force. And this is the beauty of what Jesus did. Before he left, he said, look, guys, I'm sending you the Holy Spirit, and he's going to guide you in truth. And every one of you, if you are a follower of Christ, you have the power to, to hear the Holy Spirit speaking truth to you through the word of God, showing you areas in your life where I don't know what to do with my son, but I know I've got to say something. You get on your knees, you may need to fast for a while, but say, Lord, I know I need to say something, and I'm terrified it's going to mess things up even more if I do anything, but I can't let him keep going this way, and I'm going to say something. Maybe you need to say something to your spouse. You're worried about the guys he's hanging out with, and you're like, I don't want to say anything because last time he flipped out, you need to get on your knees and pray and say, Holy Spirit, show me what I need to say to my spouse because I've got to address this. This can't go unaddressed anymore. There are some things worth making a scene about, and it's uncomfortable. I get it. I get it for a lot of you. It's very uncomfortable. I actually enjoy it. I enjoy creating awkward situations. But I understand how it is for my wife. The other day, she had to address something, and I was so proud of her because I was like, way to stand your ground. And she's like, I was so hard. So Jesus goes on. And the Jews then said to him, who do you think you are, dude? You just coming in here making a scene? 
what sign will you show us to prove your authority to do all this? And Jesus, I love Jesus. He goes like this. He says this, destroy this temple and I'll raise it again in three days. Doesn't even answer their question. (laughs) So they said, wait a second. It took 46 years to build this place and you're going to raise it in three days? But the temple he had spoken of was his body. And after he was raised from the dead, his disciples recalled what he had said, and then they believed the scripture and the words that Jesus had spoken. One of the things that's fascinating about learning from Jesus is you, is you see how he responded to people sometimes. And this is my interpretation of what he, what he was saying here. You may disagree with me. That's fine. You're wrong, but, I'm, but we'll see. I'm just kidding. <laughs> you know, there's this funny verse I was reading this week, and Paul, I'd forgotten Paul said this. Paul says, and if on anything we disagree, he's writing these, I think it's the Corinthians. He says, if on anything we disagree, don't worry. God will make it clear to you. <laughs> I'm like, like, I'm right, and he'll show you eventually. Anyway, this is my interpretation of what he says here. You can't say the right thing to the wrong person. If somebody is determined to just not believe you and not have confidence in you or to hate you, you're never going to say the right thing to them. And on the, in the inverse, you'll never say the wrong thing to the right person. And he say, I didn't say it exactly right. But yeah, but if their heart is open to it, they're going to hear it right, okay? Which is why you have to have the courage to speak up. But you may have to be content with being misunderstood. Now, you do it as clearly as you can, as lovingly as you can. But listen, there are some people that they're just not going to be won over until life takes its toll and, or God takes, takes care of things. There are some people that are just not going to want to be, because they've hardened their heart or they've chosen to be rebellious or whatever it is. And you may have to be content with being misunderstood. I had a pastor the other day. He was talking about this. He's struggling with a guy in his church, a leader in his church. And he said, man, I just know if I can meet with him a couple more times, he'll understand my heart. I can win him over. And I'm like, no, probably not. And some of you, you guys are hanging out with people you don't even like just because you're convinced you can win them over eventually. Probably not going to happen. It's okay to love them at a distance. You don't have to be liked by everybody. Let me repeat that. You don't have to be liked by everybody. That's okay. Now, that, does that mean you don't be loving to them? No, and this is where it gets really tricky, and this is where it takes the guidance of the Holy Spirit. This stuff Jesus asked of us is hard. Because sometimes you've got to stand your ground, and you've got to say, I'm going to speak truth to this situation, and I'm not mad at you, and I'm not judging you, but here's the truth of the situation. And they're going to get so mad and disagree with you, and you've still got to love them. This is where Jesus says, man, you got to turn the other cheek even when they come at you. And this is what's hard about it. But it doesn't mean you don't stand your ground and say, no, i got to make a scene here. I've got to say something. You can't keep living this way. And I love you, but you can't keep doing that. And sometimes you're going to have to be content with being misunderstood for a season, or maybe forever. But if you've listened carefully to what the Holy Spirit has told you to do, if you've sought counsel, that's one of the really important things. I can't tell you how many times... I've gotten an email in and I'm like, oh, watch. I'll write a scathing response to an email. I remember one, I wrote this scathing thing and I wrote it, I sent it to my dad just to check. I was like, dad, this is good, right? What I said to him and he wrote back, he's like, are you kidding me? (laughs) I was like, what? And I called him, I was like, what? And he's like, are you kidding me? He's like, did you even pray about that? And I'm like, no. He's like, that's that's not the right response. And that's the beauty of, of oftentimes some of us that are disagreeable, we need somebody like, very agreeable in our life, they'll say, that's nah, probably not the best way to approach that. That's the beauty of marriage, right? God brings a balance to us. But sometimes you're going to have to be okay with not being liked and saying what needs to be said at work, maybe even potentially losing your job because you're going to stand up for what's right, no matter what the cost. Good. So the story goes on. Now, while he was in Jerusalem at the Passover festival, many people saw the signs he was performing and believed in his name. Now, here's what's going to happen when you stand up and you say what nobody else wants to say. There are going to be a handful of people that go, what he said, yeah, I'm, thank you for saying that. Nobody is saying that. You know, this, we're on, on Facebook, this, this. <laughs> there are going to be people that are going, this, this, somebody's finally saying it. And they're going to go, we like you. And they'll line up behind you. But here's what's fascinating. Jesus wouldn't, he wouldn't fall for it. It says, but Jesus would not entrust himself to them, for he knew all people. He did not need any testimony about mankind, for he knew it was in each heart. One of them says he knew it was in their wicked hearts. Ouch. So here's my point with this. Your sense of conviction cannot be driven by a need to please people or be popular. It has to come from a higher place. Because you'll be popular for a while. Jesus had this same thing. He showed up in Jerusalem three days before his death, and everybody's like, yay, Jesus, you're here, yay, the Savior. And three days later, those same people are going to crucify that guy. He didn't do what we wanted. There may come a time in your life 
where the people that you trusted the most that were affirming you the most turn and say, ah, you've lost, you're off your rocker now. And you're like, I, I feel like I'm supposed to be doing this. And your sense of conviction has to come from somewhere higher. It has to come from the sense that, yeah, I know this is what God is calling me to do. And I know I need to make a scene right now and speak about this. And it may be really hard. But, if, but, but the people that, can make, that make you can also break you. But if your confidence and identity come from somewhere else, not from what people say about you, you can walk through any hell believing, hey, I'm doing my best. And you do it humbly. You got to do it humbly. See, I, I really believe I'm doing my best to serve the Lord here. And you seek counsel, but you stay humble. And sometimes you're going to have to go and you're going to have to be content with being misunderstood. And you're going to have to make a scene. And, and you're not going to be popular for it. But that's okay. Because the only one you're doing this for is an audience of one anyway. You want to stand before God and him go, well done, good and faithful servant. Come on in here. So I want to talk about one thing specifically in our culture that I feel like is worth making a scene about. I prayed about whether to do this or not because a lot of people go, oh, why you got to be talking about culture and politics? Listen, if this stuff Jesus taught doesn't apply to every area of our lives, I don't know what we're doing in here. If it only applies to sitting in here or in our families, this stuff applies to every area of our lives. And there's one area right now where I think it's worth making a scene. And it comes from one of the savage things Jesus said. This is what Jesus said at one point. He said, things that cause people to stumble are bound to come, but woe to anyone through whom they come. He says this. This is fascinating. He says, it would be better for them to be thrown into the sea with a millstone tied around their neck than to cause one of these little ones to stumble. That's like mafia stuff right there. <laughs> Luigi drops his feet into concrete and lets it dry and then drops them at the bottom of the Hudson. Jesus is saying, if you go after the innocence of a child, it would be better for us to go mafia on your tail. Take you, put a millstone around your neck, and just sink you to the bottom of the ocean. That's savage, Jesus. And then he says, so watch yourselves. <laughs> our world right now, this is all, all dead seriousness, there's an attack on our, the innocence of our children. Yes. There's this transgender ideology that's telling them, hey, yeah, go mutilate the things that God gave you, those body parts that God gave you. You can be whatever you want. Heck, you can be a cat if you want. And it's causing irreparable harm to our children. And it's all in the name of tolerance and believing that children should know what to do. But, you know, I've got a five-year-old, and every day what she wants to do is very different. If I went with her whims, I don't know what we'd be doing. Our job is to take responsibility for our kids and raise our kids in the fear and admonition of the Lord. Right, right. And there's an attack on that. And when it comes time to say, hey, yeah, this is something that I'm not, I'm not going to back down on this one. When it comes to people going after the innocence of your children, it's time to speak up. And you don't do it online. This has to be relational because it's a very nuanced conversation. Because I know some of you, your own kids are struggling with this. And you're like, this is hard. I don't know what to do. And you're maybe even afraid to talk about it with people. Hey, there's no better, safer place to talk about it than here at this church. Talk about it with people. And listen, this isn't going to be solved by you posting your junk online that like blasts them and then you walk away. This is only going to be solved through relationship and through getting to know the nuances and the complexities of the relationship. And you say, man, I know this is really hard for you. I'm not going to back down on the fact that this is wrong, but let's figure out how to walk through this together as we pray through this and work through this. And this is worth speaking up about. This isn't one of those things where you go, oh, well, everybody else seems to think it's okay. Listen, the mob is usually wrong. The mob is usually wrong. Don't ever, get, don't ever forget that. So just because everybody else is saying it and nobody else has the courage to speak up, because most people are agreeable, right? But when you don't speak up, tyranny can ensue. But there's power when the word becomes flesh and dwells among us. And if you speak that word and you do it in the right way, the truth, oftentimes just being the presence of, no, I was talking to a guy the other day, he said he showed up at a school board meeting the other day, and he's like, just when I showed up, everybody was like, <laughs> sometimes just the presence of the light makes the darkness tremble. So don't be afraid. Do not be afraid. You're not going to be liked. People are going to say mean things to you. Sometimes you just got to go consider the source. Do you want the results of their life? No. Then don't do what they're doing. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. 
And my encouragement for you is, is that, guys, there's some things that are worth making a scene about. And this is one of them specifically. Jesus, and there's a lot of them, but I think this is one that's really salient. It's really outstanding in our world today where we see it and you go, yeah, we can't handle it. We can't have this. If you're going after the innocence of children, I'm going to speak up and I'm not going to let you do that. This is worth making a scene and maybe flipping some tables over. And you do it with wisdom. You do it with courage. You do it with humility. We do it with humility. And humility means, man, I may not be exactly right on the way I did everything, but man, I'm, 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 I'm going to do it as humbly as possible, but I'm also not going to back down from the truth, even if it makes, doesn't make me friends. And that's my prayer for you guys in this world right now of darkness. There are some things we're making a scene about. And Jesus did that. And he did it in the right way. And my prayer is that we'll do it in the right way too. But it takes humility and seeking the Holy Spirit's wisdom. You don't just, you don't just, remember how Jesus, he was calculated about it. He took the time to make the whip. He didn't just go crazy. He said, all right, this is an injustice. What do I need to do? And you take some time and you pray and you ask God what to do, seek advice, and then stand out there and you speak the truth and do what's right no matter what it costs. You receive that? Let me pray for you. Father, we thank you, Lord, that you've given us, you give us the courage. All. We have the power to do what you've called us to do because of your Holy Spirit living within us. So I pray, Lord, for everyone this morning. We've all got something in our life. We're like, man, should I say something about that? With our son, with our daughter, with our husband, with our wife, at work, wherever it is, Lord, I pray that you would give us, first of all, the wisdom to seek you. And then as you give us that wisdom, Lord, we would know how to speak that truth in love to those around us, but we're not going to back down from speaking the truth. The world of darkness needs the light that we carry within us. A light, we're a city on a hill that cannot be hidden. So I pray that we would be that light to the world around us. And it's dark and it's a, and a crooked and depraved generation in which we shine like stars in the universe. So I thank you for that light that's within us, and I thank you that we're going to use that to shed your light to the entire world. If you're here this morning and you've not given your life to Jesus, I'm going to give you a chance right now to say a prayer. If you say this prayer and mean it in your heart, it's going to start you on the journey. It's going to take you out of the kingdom of darkness, forgive all your sins, and set you on the path to following him into the, into the path that he has for you in your future. So let's all say this prayer together. Lord Jesus, we repent of our sin. We turn from our way. We turn to your way. Help us walk in your truth. In your name, amen. Hey, if you just said that prayer, welcome to the kingdom of God. We've got some resources for you. You can check with Kim back there at the resource guest services. You guys can stand. Hey, two quick things. Uh, we need, if you're interested in really, you know, the best way to learn something is to teach it. And if you really decided, man, I want to really go deep in the Bible, we've got an opportunity for you. We do a thing here called sustainable, sustainable discipleship. It is not for the weak at heart, okay? It is for those who really want to grow in their spiritual walk. If you're interested in becoming a leader in that sustainable discipleship, check with Robin right here. She's up here. And uh, we'll announce the next thing next. Oh, yes. We need to raise $6,000 for Guatemala for Christmas. And we want to send it to them before Christmas. So... <laughs> That means now. So if you want to give towards that, you can give in the back. Just designate Guatemala on it. Be blessed. Have a good week. If you are ever in the Seguin area, come visit us on Sunday mornings at 9 or 11 a.m. Or you can just download our app and receive our weekly messages right to your phone. Just text CC Seguin to 77977 and click on the link that you receive. May the remainder of your week be enriched with God's favor and blessings.